All right, so today we're diving into the world of ancient Rome. But uh, this isn't your typical history lesson, no way. We're going deep on Marcus Aurelius, not just the emperor, not just the philosopher, but the person. You with me. What we often miss about Marcus Aurelius, I think, is how complex he was. Yeah. This is someone who ruled an empire, one of the most powerful in history. But at the same time, he was wrestling with very human doubts, anxieties, you know? Exactly. And we're going way beyond just meditations today. We're talking historical accounts, modern takes, the whole shebang. But get this, we're starting with a twist might surprise you. Before he was, you know, the emperor agonizing over stoic principles, Marcus Aurelius had a rather unexpected thing he did. He danced. And not just any dancing, I'm talking elaborate ancient Roman religious stuff. Oh, that's right, yeah. In his younger days, Marcus was part of the Sili. That was a priestly group dedicated to Mars, the god of war. Picture it young men dressed in sacred armor performing these ancient dances passed down over generations. Hold on, hold on. Our stoic philosopher emperor, out there in public, dressed as a warrior, dancing. Doesn't exactly scream future emperor of Rome, does it? It really makes you question that image we have, right? The eternally <laughs> serious philosopher king. But these rituals, they weren't just for show. They were deeply connected to Roman religion, their whole tradition. And don't forget, Marcus's own family claimed to be descended from Numa Pompilius, the second king of Rome. He was known for establishing a lot of Rome's religious institutions. It's like destiny was woven into his family line, you know what I mean? But how do we make sense of this? A young man so into traditional Roman religion, and then he becomes this stoic philosopher. Was it just a phase before he found philosophy or what? It's tempting to think that, but not quite. See, this fascination with ritual, with tradition, it points to something bigger in Marcus's life. This deep respect for the past, for order, and yeah, for spirituality too. And this wasn't just him being quirky, it was the world he lived in shaping him. Marcus, he was born into Rome at its absolute peak, top of their game, power, influence, ruled by what they call the five good emperors. It was an era of peace and prosperity for Rome like they'd never seen before. But there were changes coming. So imagine being Marcus Aurelius for a second, born into crazy privilege, family trees a who's who of Roman society. But he's got to be aware of these problems brewing under the surface, right? Was he always going to be great or was it more complicated than that? Well, Marcus Aurelius' rise to power. It's almost like something out of Shakespeare, honestly. Where? Full of drama, intrigue, the whole deal. And it all comes down to Emperor Hadrian. And his, well, unusual way of picking his heir. Hadrian picked a guy named Lucius alias Caesar to be his successor. He even had young Marcus engaged to Lucius' daughter to really cement things. Talk about high stakes matchmaking. But I'm sensing a but coming here. You'd be right. Fate, it seems, had other plans. Lucius Aelius, he died unexpectedly, threw the whole line of succession into chaos. Okay, so now what? Rome explodes. Gladiators roaming the streets. Not quite. Hadrian, he was always a strategist, always thinking ahead. He adapted quickly. He adopted Antoninus Pius, made him the new heir. But there was a catch. Antoninus had to adopt both Lucius's son and young Marcus Aurelius. That way, they ensured a smooth transfer of power. Wow. So even though he was from this powerful family, Marcus Aurelius wasn't a shoe in for the throne. He was adopted into it. Makes you wonder how that affected how he saw the world, don't you think? Absolutely. And what's fascinating is what he did with this period. This was like his apprenticeship for leadership, you know? He used it to develop his mind. We have letters between him and his teacher, Fronto. <laughs> they give us this incredible glimpse into how he was thinking, how it was changing. Like peeking behind the curtain of history, right? We see this young man in this crazy situation, grappling with huge ideas. And he's drawn to this philosophy that would define not just his life, but his rule, Stoicism. And this was no passing interest for Marcus. He was drawn to the teachings of Epictetus. Now, Epictetus was a former slave who became a really well-known Stoic philosopher. And that's important, especially given how deeply slavery was ingrained in the Roman Empire. Yeah, that's a great point. Definitely adds another layer to it. I mean, think about it. Marcus Aurelius, a Roman emperor, finding such deep meaning in the words of someone who had been a slave, says a lot about the kind of person he was becoming, wouldn't you say? It really does. So what was it about Epictetus specifically? Was Marcus just like philosophically starstruck? Not at all. Not at all. See, Epictetus, he was different from some other Stoics. Some of them are all about big speeches, grand theories. But Epictetus, he focused on the practical stuff the spiritual side of stoicism. He gave you a way to deal with life's challenges, you know, how to handle tough emotions, find peace in the middle of chaos. It's almost like he was getting ready, even if he didn't know it. 
for all the pressure, the responsibility of being emperor. And that pressure was no joke, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. Marcus inherits an empire at its peak, sure, but it's also an empire dealing with all kinds of threats, inside and out, wars on multiple fronts, a shaky economy, and then there's the Antonine Plague. Oh yeah, we can't forget about that. The Antonine Plague was devastating, no other way to put it. Imagine a pandemic today, but like on a global scale, disrupting everything. That was Marcus Aurelius' reality suffering, uncertainty everywhere. Yeah. But it's during those times, as tough as they were, that his commitment to Stoicism really shows. It would have been easy for him to just bury himself in his books, wouldn't it? Use Stoicism as an escape from everything going wrong. Right, you'd almost expect that from a philosopher emperor. But it sounds like he did the opposite. Exactly. His writings from this period, especially meditations, they get even more introspective. These weren't for the public, they were for him. A way to grapple with the chaos, the suffering he saw all around him. He was living Stoicism in the most extreme circumstances imaginable. Okay, I get that, but how does that work in practice? Like, it's easy to say, focus on virtue when things are calm, but when you've got a plague or barbarian armies at your door, virtue doesn't sound like much help. That's where a lot of people misunderstand Stoicism. It's not about pretending everything's perfect or ignoring the bad stuff. It's about recognizing what you can control and what you can't. Okay, I'm listening. You can't control a plague, right? But you can control how you react to it. You can't control what your enemies do, but you can control your own actions, your own virtue. So it's about finding control within the chaos, focusing on what you can do when everything else is spitting out of control. You got it. And that idea really resonated with Marcus Aurelius. He couldn't just hide in his library and meditate while the empire was falling apart. He had a duty as emperor, a responsibility. And Stoicism gave him a way to handle that, to make impossible choices, deal with hardship, all while trying to be a good, just ruler. And we see that in his writing too, don't we? Like in, in the first book of Meditations, he's talking about the lessons he learned from his family, his teachers. He thanks his mom for his moral upbringing, which makes sense. But he never mentions his rhetoric tutor. And this guy was famous. It's a small thing, but it's so revealing. Right. This is Marcus Aurelius, known for his eloquence, his writing, and he chooses to focus on his mom's influence on his character, not on his fancy rhetorical skills that he was known for. It tells you a lot about what he truly valued. Totally. It's like he's saying, look, words are one thing, but it's your actions, your character that really matter. And it wasn't just talk either. While he was emperor, Marcus Aurelius put in place a bunch of legal reforms. Many of them were about improving the lives of Rome's most vulnerable people, slaves, widows, orphans. And that's so important when you're trying to understand how Stoicism shaped his rule. I can see that. This wasn't just random acts of charity, you know? This was rooted in the Stoic idea that we're all connected, all part of the same human family. Okay, but hold on. Helping slaves, widows, how does that fit into Stoicism? That doesn't seem like typical Roman emperor stuff. It's easy to forget, but Stoicism is all about justice, about fairness, compassion for everyone. It teaches that we're all part of this universal brotherhood, no yeah. matter your social status. So even in a system as unequal as the Roman Empire, Marx Aurelius used his power to make things a little more just, a little more equal. Which makes the whole issue of Christian persecution during his reign even more confusing. It's a real head-scratcher. How could this emperor, known for being wise and compassionate, how could he allow Christians to be persecuted? It just doesn't add up. It's one of those things that makes you really think, right? Makes yeah. you realize how easy it is to simplify these historical figures. Totally. So how do we make sense of it then? Well, context is everything, you know? Christianity, it was still pretty new during Marcus's time. And a lot of people in power in the Roman government, they were suspicious of it. I can see why new religion comes along, challenges the existing power structure. Exactly. Roman society, it was built on tradition, on order, and Christianity, with its one God and rejecting the Roman gods. Some people saw it as a threat to all of that, like it was trying to undermine everything. So it wasn't so much that Marcus Aurelius hated Christians personally, it was more about keeping things stable during a time that was already pretty chaotic. Exactly. I mean, think about it. The empire is already dealing with plagues, wars, a messed up economy. It's not hard to see how people would be on edge, right? And that leads to less tolerance for anything that seems different, disruptive. Makes you think about how we judge historical figures, doesn't it? Even the most enlightened people are still shaped by the world they live in. For sure. But that doesn't mean we can't learn from them. 
If anything, the fact that Marcus Aurelius was so complicated, his reign so full of contradictions, it gives us even more to think about. How so? Well, he wasn't a perfect Stoic, was he? And he wasn't a perfect ruler either. He had to make hard choices, compromises. He got criticized, yeah. just like any leader throughout history. He was under an incredible amount of pressure. It's easy to forget that. Absolutely. And, you know, even his decision to name Commodus as his heir. Oh, you mean Commodus, the emperor who wanted to be a gladiator? Yeah, history has not been kind to him. Not at all. Yeah. And it's often seen as this huge failure by Marcus Aurelius. Like, how could the great philosopher emperor make such a bad choice? Right. But we have to remember, Marcus Aurelius wasn't just choosing some random guy. He was bound by tradition, by how dynastic succession worked. To choose someone else, someone not his son, would have been unheard of and to potentially really dangerous, could have thrown the whole empire into chaos. So he was stuck between a rock and a hard place, upholding tradition, even if it might put the empire at risk, or breaking with centuries of precedent, which could have been just as bad. Exactly, it's a dilemma for sure. And we also have to remember that what we know about Commodus, a lot of it comes from historians who had their own agendas, their own biases. It's totally possible Commodus wasn't quite the disaster he's often made out to be. It's like judging a book by its cover, but the cover was designed centuries later. Exactly. We can't just look at the past through our own modern lens. It all goes back to what you were saying before. Judging historical figures is never simple. Nope. But even with all that, there's still so much we can learn from them, right? Absolutely. And I think one of the biggest takeaways from Marcus Aurelius is this. Stoicism. It's not about being perfectly serene, totally at peace all the time. It's not about becoming some kind of emotionless robot who's immune to all the bad stuff life throws at you. That's a relief to hear. It's about striving to do the right thing, to make virtuous choices, even when things are falling apart around you. So it's a journey, not a destination. Exactly. And it's a journey we're all on, in a way whether we're facing down barbarian armies or just trying to get through our own day-to-day -day lives. Love that. And speaking of journeys and trying to do the right thing, we've got time for one last story about Marcus Aurelius, just to show you how this guy really tried to live by his principles. Remember we were talking about his legal reforms, how he wanted to use his power to protect people. I do, yeah. Well, get this, one of the things he did involved tightrope walkers. Tightrope walkers. Yeah, apparently he was a fan of those performances but he knew how dangerous they were. So he passed a law that said all tightrope walkers had to use safety nets. He mandated safety nets for tightrope walkers. That's specific. It does seem kind of random, right? But I think it says a lot about him. He saw the humanity in everyone, even the entertainers, and he used his power to keep them safe. It's a good reminder that compassion can show up in unexpected ways and that even small acts of kindness can make a difference. Beautifully said. And on that note, we'll leave you to ponder the strange and insightful life of Marcus Aurelius. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep diving. Instead of craving, find the harmony. 
The memory of every single overwhelmed in time In the rock ballad we find the climb Do not indulge in dreams Wrapping up the blessings true In the rock rhythm find what's in you Read with diligence Not a superficial sound In the rock verse let the wisdom resound I won't be shaken, I won't be swayed Between a risk and a gamble. This, what we do here, this is calculated, okay? We weigh the odds, we make a choice. You see that man right there? Do you remember him? You gotta block out everything and be in the moment. Not the past, not the future, right now. You have control of this. This belongs to you. This is yours. You're the captain, you're the master, you're the foreman, you're the general, you're the head. Don't give control of this to nobody. Don't let this man control you. Don't let him control you. You got to get real dogs. Now, like I was telling you before, if you want to be ordinary, you ain't even got to listen to me. Just go on about your business. Hard times create hard men. Hard men create soft times. Soft times create soft men. Soft men create hard times. If you don't fail, you're not even trying. My wife told me this great expression. To get something you never had, you have to do something you never did. Failure has been achieved, thank God. Now, the only place to go from failure is to win. You have to achieve failure. You have to take it that far. Nobody wants to go that far. It's too scary. But you know something? I got news for you. That's where winning is. It always has been. Nothing's changed. Come on, come on. What's the matter with you? Ma. Ma. There is no tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. Les Brown's a motivational speaker. He made an analogy about this. He says, imagine you're on your deathbed and standing around your deathbed are the ghosts representing your... We humans have two great problems. The first is knowing when to begin. The second is knowing when to stop. Things rarely change for the better in your life unless you change them. No amount of anxiety makes any difference to anything that is going to happen. Alan Watts Rest. Don't care. Give back. Even if it's donating your tag sale leftovers or handing a dollar bill over to someone less fortunate. Do it. It'll make you feel good. Anything that's happened to you has happened for a reason. Wayne Dyer The true joy of a man is to do that which properly belongs unto a man. That which is most proper unto a man is, first, to be kindly affected towards them that are of the same kind and nature as he is himself, to contemn all sensual motions and appetites to discern rightly all plausible fancies and imaginations, to contemplate the nature of the universe, both it and things that are done in it, in which kind of contemplation three several relations are to be observed, the first to the apparent secondary cause, the second to the first original cause, God, from whom originally proceeds whatsoever doth happen in the world, the third and last, to them that we live and converse with, what use may be made of it to their use and benefit. Some of you are not successful not because you can't do this business. Number one, you're listening to people who have no business in your ears. Stop. It works. It works. 
high school dropout. America, it works if you work it. You can have and be and do whatever you want. I told you, I got a coach. I, I, I had to pay to learn how to listen. Okay, you missed that one, that's a bonus. No, you missed that. I had to get a coach to teach me to stop going this way and stop going this way and follow what I'm told. Okay, I'm gonna say it one more time. I had to get, how many of you honestly, you don't have a coach? Raise your hand, be honest. You don't have a coach, be honest. Raise your hand, you don't have a coach. You need a coach to teach you how to get people out your ear. You need a coach to teach you how to go even when you don't feel like going. You need a coach to make you wake up and think about your family. You need a coach to help you get, please listen to me. Nothing is impossible. That's a mindset. Write this down. I need to do something serious about my limiting beliefs. I want you to take this word out of your vocabulary. I shouldn't even say it, but some of you have it, so I have to say it. Write it down in your phone, please. I need you to replace fear with faith. No more fear. Jim Rohn said, all of us, we got the same ending. We're going to die. So if you know you're going to die, why are you playing it safe? Like if you know you're going to die, why are you listening to other people tell you about your life? If you're going to die, why don't you live your own life? Man, that's what I loved about my grandma. She drove until she was 89 years old. She died in her own home. She didn't die nowhere else. My grandma lived her life on her terms. My grandma got her hair done every two weeks. She still was getting her hair done. She was still going and getting massage. She was still going to get manicure and pedicure. With the if you don't value your time, neither will others. Anyone you love can die anytime. Cherish them. Believe you can and you're halfway there. Theodore Roosevelt. We must never stop dreaming. Dreams provide nourishment for the soul. Just as a meal does for the body. To get married means to have your rights and double your responsibilities. When another person makes you suffer, it is because he suffers deeply within himself, and his suffering is spilling over. He does not need punishment. He needs help. That's the message he is sending. Thich Nhat Hanh. If in this kind of life thy body be able to hold out, it is a shame that thy soul should faint first, and give over, take heed, lest of a philosopher thou become a mere Caesar in time, and receive a new tincture from the court. For it may happen if thou dost not take heed. Keep thyself therefore truly simple, good, sincere, grave, free from all ostentation, a lover of that which is just, religious, kind, tender-hearted, strong, and vigorous to undergo anything that becomes thee. Endeavor to continue such, as philosophy, hadst thou wholly and constantly applied thyself unto it, would have made and secured thee. Worship the gods, procure the welfare of men. This life is short. Charitable actions and a holy disposition is the only fruit of this earthly life. conversation with someone with something that says you're in heaven this is what you should have been on earth and are you really in heaven now or are you in hell a lot of us speak in hollow words i used to speak in hollow words i don't do anymore everything that comes out of my mouth has substance it's real and we all have these feelings in our bodies in our minds in our souls i act on mine a lot of us who are afraid of something we allow our minds to choose the path of least resistance so we go a different route. And I'm afraid of something that's telling me you must do this that. Thing. You must do that. Yeah. You have to go that way. And most of us don't understand that mentality. We go left and we wonder why we haven't fulfilled something in our lives. You've just gone through a breakup and it's the worst thing you've ever been through. 
because you haven't had the time and the experience yet to develop worse and to turn around and look at that in relation to the realities of a long life well lived. And one day you're going to try and look back and you're going to say, that really wasn't such a disaster. And in fact, that was probably the best thing ever happened to me. I get it. The pain is unbearable. You keep playing it back in your head. The situation is on repeat. Over and over and over, you keep trying to see where you went wrong. You feel like you can't take the pain anymore. What you gonna do? Are you gonna prove them right? Or are you gonna prove them wrong?